Wow. Bonjour à tous et bravo d'être aussi nombreux en ce samedi matin. Mon nom est Christine O'Krent et je suis ravie d'ouvrir cette longue et riche journée consacrée à un thème qui nous fait tous chaud au cœur. Le meilleur est à venir. Vous savez que dans quelques instants, nous aurons le, le privilège et le plaisir d'accueillir le professeur Mohamed Younous. Mais sans plus attendre, je vais demander à Eric Falt, sous-directeur général de l'UNESCO, et à François Lemarchand, président de la Fondation Nature et Découverte et cofondateur de cette université de la Terre, de bien vouloir ouvrir nos débats. Monsieur Falt, Monsieur Lemarchand. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers amis, je suis très heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui au nom de la directrice générale de l'UNESCO, Madame Irina Bokova. Vous le savez sans doute, l'UNESCO accueille aujourd'hui l'Université de la Terre pour sa cinquième édition. En 2005, nous avions ouvert nos portes à la toute première université avec le plaisir de, de voir vivre avec elle notre vocation de forum, d'échange. Et je dois reconnaître, avec aussi un petit peu de, de curiosité, pour euh, comprendre ce qui pouvait amener, à l'époque, 4000 jeunes gens, un week-end de, de printemps, ou de presque printemps dans le cas de cette année, à pousser les portes de nos amphithéâtres. Notre curiosité fut vite récompensée par la qualité et la diversité des interventions de cette université et nous sommes fiers d'en être les partenaires aux côtés de la Fondation Nature et Découverte, dont je salue ici le président, M. François Lemarchand. Le succès ne s'est pas démenti avec les années, et je crois que vous êtes près de 6 000 cette année, si je ne m'abuse, à être enregistrés pour cet événement. Et ce partenariat de l'UNESCO avec l'Université de la Terre, pour nous, est un partenariat riche de sens. D'abord, en ce qu'il incarne l'une des vocations premières de cette maison, offrir une tribune aux hommes et aux femmes, politiques, scientifiques, artistes, militants, pour échanger, penser et partager sur les grands enjeux sociétaux. Ensuite, parce qu'il témoigne aussi de la profonde convergence de nos intérêts et de nos objectifs. La préservation de la biodiversité, la liberté d'expression, le rapprochement des cultures, qui sont autant de thèmes au cœur des préoccupations de votre génération. Et nous vous devons, en quelque sorte, de, vous donner, de mieux vous donner la parole, de mieux écouter des acteurs éclairés et créatifs de la société civile qui ont une, une vision à partager. Enfin aussi, ce, ce partenariat est pour nous une, une belle opportunité d'approfondir notre réflexion commune sur le développement durable et plus généralement sur la société durable, la société que, je crois, nous voulons tous créer sans nécessairement savoir comment y parvenir. En tout cas, ce sont des thèmes qui nous ramènent aux, aux principes fondateurs de l'UNESCO et au nouvel humanisme qui sous-tend notre action. Alors, je voudrais remercier simplement ici toutes celles et ceux qui vont se, se succéder sur scène de prendre ce temps de partage et d'écoute et de nous dire que pour que le, le meilleur soit à venir, il nous faut, oui, nous engager et penser différemment. Permettez-moi par ailleurs de, de saisir l'occasion de rendre hommage aujourd'hui à un grand ami de l'UNESCO qui nous invitait à militer ainsi, à, à penser différemment, et je veux bien sûr parler de Stéphane Essel. Il avait accompagné ces dernières années l'organisation dans ses grandes, dans ses grandes euh, orientations et ses grandes décisions. Monsieur Essel s'était exprimé il y a encore deux ans à cette même tribune euh, dans les débats sur une nouvelle société. Et s'il fa fallait désigner, désigner un, un maître à penser, le, le, peut-être le parrain spirituel de cette euh, université de la Terre, euh, je ne crois pas que je vous trahirai, euh, euh, mon cher François, cher Sylvain, en disant que Stéphane Essel serait certainement celui-là et qu'il serait avec nous ce matin, qu'il est avec nous ce matin d'ailleurs. Donner de, de l'espoir, repenser nos modèles de fonctionnement sociaux et économiques, 
C'est un combat que partage aussi l'autre personne à qui je voudrais rendre hommage aujourd'hui, le grand invité de cette matinée, M. Mohamed Younous. It is a great pleasure, Mr. Younous, and a great honor to welcome you today. I think in many ways you illustrate perfectly an ideal that we here at UNESCO hold closest to our heart, which is to say that the power of ideas can change the world. Who better than you can come and talk about the importance of rethinking, inventing new models, not suffering without taking a stand and continuing to believe. And I would like to point out to all of you perhaps what you know or what you don't know, which is that since 1977, when the Grameen Foundation was officially established, over 300 million people throughout the world, most of whom are women, have benefited either directly or indirectly from uh, microcredit loans of the Grameen Bank. Even if uh, the desire to act does not make us all great inventors of microcredit or creators of joint ventures, advocates of alternative financing, or even more rarely, Nobel Prize laureates, it does make us enlightened citizens and stakeholders. C'est donc le rôle de l'UNESCO d'encourager les idées, ces idées, de les partager, de les faire grandir. Encore une fois, soyez les bienvenus et je vous souhaite à tous et à toutes une riche journée d'écoute et de débat. Merci. Mmh. Euh, merci Eric et... Et merci à Jean Oudouz, qui est le président de l'UNESCO, que j'aperçois au premier rang, de votre amitié pour nous accueillir et de nous soutenir depuis ces huit ans passés ensemble pour recevoir l'Université de la Terre. Et bonjour. Bonjour. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette cinquième Université de la Terre. Quand nous l'avons créée en 2005, nous voulions nous se faire, faire se rencontrer les acteurs de l'écologie et ceux de l'entreprise et de l'économie, en présence de vous tous, les représentants de la société civile, et essayer de bâtir ensemble une nouvelle société écologique, humaniste et prospère pour demain. Nous avons tous été témoins pendant ces huit années de l'incroyable accélération des mutations de toutes sortes, technologiques, culturelles, sociétales, géopolitiques. Des mutations si rapides que notre compréhension de ce qui se passe peine à suivre et nous déstabilise. Nous ne comprenons plus beaucoup le sens de l'histoire et sommes facilement portés à l'angoisse, au désarroi, au pessimisme. Et pourtant, pourtant, nous avons donné pour thème à cette Université de la Terre « Le meilleur est à venir ». Et « Le meilleur est à venir », ce n'est pas une, exercice, une exhortation béate d'optimisme pour le futur, qui oublierait aussi les énormes souffrances et les difficultés dans lesquelles nous nous débattons. Dire « Le meilleur est à venir », c'est avant tout une attitude une posture, c'est nous libérer de la dépression qui nous empêche d'agir pour nous charger d'espérance et retrouver le goût de l'avenir. Tant il est vrai que l'optimiste consent à être, à être acteur de sa vie, alors que le pessimiste se condamne à n'en être que le spectateur. Soyez le changement que vous voulez voir dans le monde, nous exhortait Gandhi. Et c'est bien de cela qu'il s'agit. Chacun de nous est capable du meilleur, chacun de nous est responsable du futur. Et les changements sont d'une telle ampleur que nous vivons sans doute une, mute, une de ces mutations prodigieuses et passionnantes de l'histoire que l'on pourrait comparer au passage du Moyen Âge à la Renaissance ou encore à la Révolution industrielle qui nous a amenés au temps moderne. Les marins connaissent bien ces moments d'angoisse quand la météo se dégrade et qu'ils sont ballottés par la tempête avec une visibilité réduite à néant. 
Mais en affrontant le vent de face, avec une voile réduite au minimum, ils font route lentement, mais sûrement, vers le magnifique ciel bleu et le soleil qui se cache généralement derrière les nuages et la tempête. Continuer à faire route malgré l'inconfort ou ne rien faire et aller vers la noyade, voici, je pense, les termes de notre choix. Nous sommes plus que jamais obligés de nous engager et d'arrêter de nous complaire dans notre dépression. Et si nous ne le faisons pas pour nous, faisons-le au moins pour les nouvelles générations. Chaque jour, nous pouvons voir des initiatives multiples qui se déroulent autour de nous et partout dans le monde. Partout, de nombreux signes indiquent que la flamme de l'espérance continue à brûler et qu'une nouvelle aventure encore plus passionnante s'ouvre à nous. Et j'aime cette phrase que je reprends, pardonnez-moi pour ceux qui viennent depuis longtemps, mais à chaque université de la Terre, cette phrase qui est « Le fracas des, des arbres qui s'effondrent masque le murmure de la forêt qui pousse. » Et puis aussi, mais vous la connaissez absolument tous, c'est la la belle histoire du colibri que nous a conté maintes fois Pierre Rabhi à ses universités de la Terre, où il n'est pas cette année, malheureusement, qui est, euh, mais je peux le raconter en deux mots, un jour, un grand, forêt dévaste la for un grand, un grand feu dévaste la forêt, tous les animaux s'enfuient, et pourtant un petit colibri se promène entre un cours d'eau et, et le front des flammes, et en amenant sa petite goutte d'eau et la laissant tomber dans le feu. Et les autres animaux se moquent de lui. Il lui dit, mais qu'est-ce que tu veux faire Tu ne vas pas à, tout, à toi tout seul, tu ne vas pas éteindre le feu de la forêt. Il lui dit, j'éteindrai sans doute pas tout seul le feu de la forêt, mais je fais ma part. Eh bien, cette Université de la Terre 2013 veut donner la parole à tous ceux qui veulent être les bâtisseurs engagés de la société du futur. Ces bâtisseurs d'une société portée par la confiance plutôt que la défiance, c'est-à-dire une société qui reprend le goût du risque. Nous avons construit trop de barrières, trop de normes, trop d'interdits, de peurs qui nous ligotent et brident notre créativité. L'aventure du futur ne peut se vivre sans retrouver le goût du risque. Comme vous le savez, je suis un écologiste convaincu, mais si l'écologie prône la responsabilité, l'équilibre, l'harmonie, elle n'a pas pour autant renoncé au progrès et à l'espérance. Et puis un dernier mot pour saluer toutes ces entreprises qui soutiennent et rendent possible cette université de la Terre. Crédit coopératif, Clarins, Nature et Découverte, Carrefour, Ionis, Science et Vie, Enkel, Psychologie Magazine. Et bien leur témoignage, leur engagement, pardon, leur engagement est le témoignage que l'entreprise reste dans le monde à venir une des constructions humaines les plus efficaces pour bâtir des projets bénéficiant aux hommes. Et que si elles sont parfois capables du pire, elles sont surtout et avant tout douées pour mobiliser de formidables moyens humains et financiers au service des buts collectifs et au service de ce meilleur qui est à venir, si on le veut bien. Mobilisons-les mobilisons avec exigence au service d'un modèle économique porteur de sens et de valeurs humaines. Et ce qui me donne le privilège de vous présenter un de ces entrepreneurs extraordinaires qui a révolutionné le monde de la finance au service des plus démunis. Un entrepreneur qui a reçu le prix Nobel de la paix pour l'impact de son travail au service des autres et d'un monde meilleur. Un super colibri. J'ai donc le plaisir de vous présenter Mohamed Younous. may well be the first time you call the hummingbird. Je vous précise, et pardon de ne pas l'avoir fait plus tôt, que la traduction en français, vous la trouverez sur le canal 3 de vos écouteurs. L'anglais, si besoin est, sur le canal 1. But we're going to speak English, if you don't mind. Okay. 
Professor Yunus, as you are a world traveler, and as you are well aware, we in our part of Europe are extremely preoccupied with a deep economic crisis which has triggered unemployment and created a lot of uh, social uh, suffering. All of your fellow Nobel Prizes, not peace prize, but uh, Nobel economists, seem to be at a complete loss to explain what's been happening. What is your analysis? Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to this discussion. Uh, first point I want to make that uh, this has been a <clears throat> uh, big export from the West to the East, the crisis. <laughs> the crisis was not done uh, by the poor countries, but they are the sufferers, worse sufferers than anybody else in the West. Uh, because something happened in one country, and also particularly, I would say, in one city. Uh, brought the financial crisis and then it transmitted to the rest of the world and the suffering was in the world where people at the very bottom level they are the worst sufferer of this crisis they lost their job factories closed down because when something happens in Europe the whole of uh, rest of the world suffers because whatever we do in our countries we try to sell our products to Europe. When the economy slows down here, our economy shuts down completely. We don't have anything left. So this is one thing I want to draw your attention because uh, it's not simply crisis in Europe. It's a global crisis. We suffer most, but our voice probably doesn't get heard over uh, the wave. Uh, so it's not felt that way. The second point I would like to make that um, it's a man-made crisis. It's not a tsunami, it's not a disaster. We made it. So we have to find out how did we make it. One explanation was in the beginning, uh, somehow it disappeared over time, that in order to uh, continue with our uh, system, we converted this, the financial market as a kind of um, gambling casino. It's no longer business of the kind that we talk about. So it became the greed-driven, speculation-driven uh, betting rather than uh, real production. So when you move away from the real economy to the speculative economy, this is what happens. This is one lesson. So we are trying, the whole world, particularly Europe and um, the United States, trying to get back to the, what they would call normal situation so that economy gets back to the rail. And I'm saying going, going back to the old system or old uh, way of doing things is not a solution. It temporarily looks, you can sigh a breath of relief, okay, it's over. It's not over. Simply waiting for another big crisis because you have not fixed anything. So we have to go back and start fixing things. And fixing is something in the basic conceptual framework. Unless we undo that conceptual framework or redo the conceptual framework, this is not going to end. And what is the main uh, frailty or the, the main failure of that framework? What should be changed uh, first? My, my way of uh, explaining it, I've been saying, we have made this whole world in a kind of money-centric world. All we do is go for money, maximization of profit. We forget everything else. It, it absorbs all our attention. It becomes a habit. It becomes a passion for us. It became a, a kind of a, a, a mindset which drives us into that direction. So we, we in, a, in a way, we have become a, sort of money-making robots. We are not... Uh, uh, figuring out or we don't remember that we are human beings. We are not robots which uh, perform in a certain way, uh, in a very limited, restricted way. So my uh, way that can we rediscover as ourselves as a human being, 
as a much bigger entity than just a money-making entity. Uh, after all, we forgot as if we forgot our purpose. Why we make money? Uh, we can try to uh, try to explain everything as if making money will solve everything. It doesn't. It only uh, narrows as a human as a as a human being. It only narrows us down more and more, rather than expands us. Uh, we a hu huge uh, entity called human being kind of compressed into being money-making machine. That is the sad part of it. That's what creates the problem. When you withdraw all your attention from everything else, uh, everything else suffers. We, in the way of uh, money creating money-centric world, we have created problems for everybody, all of us. We have made the world a dangerous place, uh, creating an uh, uh, environmental problem, uh, and we have created social problems for us. We have created the problem of uh, energy crisis, food crisis, and every other crisis. Uh, so this is what I, I, I'm inviting, that we have to rediscover, rediscover ourselves as a human being, be, uh, create a system uh, which allows us to uh, enlarge ourselves, not uh, narrows ourselves. And that's where the concept of social business comes in. And indeed, you have proved over the years that by joining forces with major corporations, which are indeed profit-oriented, you can induce them into diversifying their activities and get into ethical purposes as well as economic ones. I did it uh, because I was uh, desperate, I was frustrated in my own situation in Bangladesh. What we do, Bangladesh is a situation where lots of poverty, lots of uh, poor health, housing, and, and then the environmental degradation uh, hits us most uh, hardest because we are in the front line of uh, uh, environmental degradation because when the sea level rises, we are the one which will get hurt. And we are the one who have to leave our country because we, it will not be a livable country anymore. It's gradually creeping in. So all these things came. And as I was trying to do uh, little things for poor women in the villages, which became known as microcredit and gradually expanded, I became interested in other issues. And I started creating uh, a solution of my own without realizing what others will think about it. I started creating business to solve problems. So it became a habit with me. Every time I see a problem, I want to pay attention to it. I create a business to solve it. And over years, I created more than 60 such companies. A business rather than a foundation, rather than another NGO. Exactly. I didn't want to go through the philanthropy route, charity route, because I always felt if I do it a charity way, charity money will do the job only once. It, it, it doesn't come back. So I was trying to find a business way. In a business way, if I try to solve that problem, that business money will go out and do the job and come back. So it will have an endless life. The, uh, that, uh, what I call now social business, so, uh, compared to the charity money, which has one life, social business money has endless life. And it's sustainable, it lets you expand, it is uh, independent, it uh, stands on its feet. So that was my drive. To want to so create each those. project is meant to generate a margin of profit as long as it's reinvested in, the, in that very same project. Exactly. Uh, more precisely that we try to explain it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. So first, it's a non-dividend. I personally, I'm not interested in the dividend. I create that company to remain a sustainable company. It makes a profit. Profit stays with the company. And for the purpose of the company is fulfilled when it goes round and round and expands. Uh, investor, if I'm the investor, I am entitled to take back my investment money over a period of time. It may be five years, 10 years, whatever time I want. I can get back my exact money terms, investment money, nothing more than that. But it still own the company. So the company performs what I intended it to do for and try to make it more efficient. So that is the purpose of the social business. So this is very, dist people start noticing it and saying, why are you doing that? Uh, you should be making money. That's what the businesses do. I said, yes, businesses do, but I don't do. 
then how can you run a business uh, without making profit? I said, I see no problem. Uh, the company makes pro profit, but I'm not interested in the profit. I'm interested in getting the job done. So I created those things. And when other people became interested, then I started giving it a name, call it social business, to explain what I do. And gradually, this is uh, becoming more and more, uh, getting more and more attention. The difference between the conventional business and social business is, in the conventional business, profit is the objective. In social business, solving the problem is the objective. Suddenly, the whole thing changes. You bring the technology of the business, but you're using for a completely different purpose. I tried to explain it by saying that it's almost like a vehicle or a car. The car has no mind of its own. It's the driver who has the mind of its own. Driver takes the car wherever he wants to go. So if you want to go up the mountain, you can go up the mountain. But if you want to take this car to the beach, you can go to the beach, whatever destination you choose. So the business is a vehicle, and it is our, at our disposal. We are the drivers. We decide where we want to take. So that's the difference between the two. One last question before uh, our friends, uh, those very bright uh, students take over because they have plenty of questions to ask you. So far, what have been the most successful social businesses you have launched? I thought all of them very successful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk about the ones that failed <laughs> because I don't give up. Those who, those who so failed. which is the one which failed, which has failed so uh, far? Uh, over years, we have done small, each social business, we start out with a very small one. So even if it fails, it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't upset you. Some of the small things that we did in healthcare didn't work, but other healthcare things flourished. So we see how to redesign it, how to get it started again, those kind of things. Uh, to give examples, things that we have done ourselves on our own, give one example from there, and then I try to give example with the, with the multinational companies that jo has joined hands with us and created social business. The one I particularly want to mention because I'm personally excited about it, we, in Bangladesh, we have 160 million people. 70% of the people have no electricity. You're familiar with those countries where 70% or so people have no electricity. So you go there, after sun goes down, it's all dark. Only little kerosene lamps comes up to give a little light. And that's what our life is. That's how centuries have gone by. So when I see that, I said, maybe this is an opportunity for us. The fact that grid electricity has not reached anybody. Why don't we think about renewable energy taking over before the fossil fuel electricity comes on? And I got to think about it. and it's, created a small company called Grameen Shakti or Grameen Energy to bring solar energy in the villages. Everybody said, are you crazy? Solar energy in Bangladesh? This is not Europe that you're talking about. I said, no, I would, since they don't have electricity, maybe this is a solution. So it is hard time to sell one or two solar home system per month. And if we could do that, we got very excited that we sold two solar home systems this month. Then we tried to do a 10 solar home system, 20 solar home system. 16 years later, today, we sell more than 1,000 solar home system per day. And we just crossed last November our first million homes with solar home system. So it completely changed everybody. Because today it became so easy to sell because the solar prices coming down, solar panels prices, and the uh, kerosene price is going up. So today, at the price, what you cost you to have little kerosene lamps, you can afford solar energy. So it is expanding. It took us 16 years to have first million solar home system in Bangladesh with this company. Now, it will take only less than three years to have the second million to reach. And then on, less than three years, two years, and so on. So this is an exciting because we didn't do it to for making money. We did it to solve the problem of people. Who, there are two problems. One, kerosene is imported, and kerosene is a health hazard. The fume of kerosene, particularly for women, uh, it creates a lot of health problems. 
And then it is a fire hazards. Many of our villages get burned down because something went wrong with the kerosene lamp and caught fire in one house, spread the whole village and burned the whole village. So this is exciting because we are doing something environmentally. At the same time, it helps people. It's done in a business way, but not in the business that we want to make money out of it. The second one quickly I will add is the joint venture with Danone here, uh, the uh, French company. We created a joint venture in Bangladesh to produce yogurt to solve the problem of malnutrition among the children of Bangladesh. 48% of the children of Bangladesh are malnourished, and most of them are seriously malnourished. So we were wondering what can we do. Then one idea came when we met uh, the chairman of uh, Danone, why don't we create a company in Bangladesh as a social business? And he readily agreed, Frank Ribo. And out of that came this company. And now we produce uh, yogurt, all the micronutrients which are missing in the children, we put it in the yogurt. And then it is the talent and the genius of uh, Danone people uh, to suppress the ugly taste of all those micronutrients that you gave and make it very delicious and make it very cheap. So even the poor child can afford to eat it because he loves it or she loves it because it's very delicious. So now they're eating it and improving their health, changing their health. And it's all done because Danone has uh, already signed up that they will follow it as a social business principle, never take any dividend. They can take back their investment money, but they continue to expand and we also follow the same thing. So this is an example. Many other such companies came forward to have joint venture with us. OK. Euh, on va passer maintenant aux questions euh, des étudiants de Sciences Po X, euh, Paris-Dauphine, euh, Université Paris 1, je crois. Beaucoup de questions, comme toujours, pas beaucoup de temps. Donc, qui se lance en premier uh, Good morning, uh, Professor Younous and Madame Krent. Um, I'm Elise Torel, a student of Sciences Po X en Provence. Um, microcredit is used as a means to foster development in developing countries and as a means to fight exclusion in developed countries, especially in France. So my question is, uh, how could you explain the universality of microcredit and its capacity to serve different goals? Thank you. Well, first I want to draw attention to the shortcoming of the banking system. Somehow we accepted the banking system is great, they're serving a break, great purpose. They may do, but they, we don't point out they miss out something which is very important. They miss out bulk of the human population on this planet. I sometimes mention that two-thirds of the world population has nothing to do with banking institutions because banks will not let them come anywhere near them. So that's how the institution has been developed. And the left of the people are left at the mercy of uh, loan sharks and every other informal thing that you can do. As a result, people suffer. People cannot get out of the situation they are in. In any situation, you need a dollar to catch a dollar. If you don't have your first dollar in your hand, you cannot catch the other dollar. So with empty hand that you can't go very far. It was the bank's responsibility to build, make this dollar available so that they can start their life in a way they can use their creative power. Whether it's in rich country or poor country, doesn't matter. This is a vacuum left out. Microcredit filled that gap, came up with a system which works. Previously, conventional banks were telling the world it cannot be done, so that's why we don't do it. We challenged that we showed that it can be done. Then they first said it can be done only in Bangladesh because some cultural factor or something. I said, no, it's a human factor. Human beings are able to do things on them, on themselves, provided you provide the services they need to do that. So gradually they spread over the whole country, whole world, and that's what done in uh, France. And we done, uh, we have six branches in New York City. And now with 12,000 borrowers in that, and uh, repayment is nearly 100%, 99.4% if 
in New York City. Then we are invited in other cities now because of the success in New York. We are invited in Los Angeles, in Omaha, Nebraska, in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, Indianapolis, and many other cities. So we keep on doing that, exactly the same result. And it transforms people, because once you have access to that, and you change everything. But our legal system comes up to stop that. Because in the US, there's a very strange welfare system. Welfare law says if you earn one dollar, if you are in welfare, if you earn one dollar, you have to report it to the welfare authority. And what do the welfare authority do? They will deduct it from your welfare check. I said, that's a crazy thing to do. I said, if I was writing that legislation, I would do the other way. I would say, yes, you have to report it to the welfare authority, and the welfare authority will match you with another dollar. And that's the incentive you should give. Rather than creating barriers. See how our minds work? Our minds work against the interest of the people. So microcredit now is a factor. It could have done much better. Two things are missing. One, that we are not taking it as a serious banking proposition yet. Still, banks have not changed their style of doing things. And there are legal barriers where microcredit cannot function. So we want, we should, if you remove those barriers, microcredit can continue to reach out more and more people, give them the dignity of standing on their feet and changing their own life. Et je salue d'ailleurs la présence parmi nous de Madame Novak, qui, comme chacun le sait, est la grande, je n'ose pas dire la grande prêtresse, mais la grande apôtre du microcrédit en France. Une autre question yeah, Good morning, everyone. Um, I have a question. You were mentioning profit and dividends. Um, do you consider a profit-driven microfinance institution to be a threat to the social objectives of microfinance? That is, uh, does microfinance have to be a non-profit activity um, to fight effectively against poverty? I'm glad you asked that question. Just now I explained what is social business. Social business is not a non-profit plan. All we are saying that I don't want to take the profit. Profit stays with the company. So when we created Grameen Bank, in the back of our mind was that idea working. I didn't want to make money out of Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank is owned by the borrowers. I didn't buy one share of Grameen Bank. I could have done that. I could have owned the whole bank, but I didn't do that. Because my intention was to make sure people who are the borrowers, they have the, all the benefits. Grameen Bank now earns profit. Profit goes back to them as dividends. I don't want anything of that. Uh, so uh, I see microcredit as a, as a way to help people get out of the situation they are in. I didn't want to make Grameen Bank as a kind of tool to take, give money and make money for somebody else. So that is the basic thing. I'm not against making profit. It's a question of profit for whom. That is the issue. Uh, but I define what should be the fair interest rate in a microcredit program. And my definition is cost of fund plus 10% on top of it. If you are within that range of interest, then you are in the green zone of microcredit. You are an excellent Grameen Bank. Even if you are making profit personally, it's okay for me if you want to do that. But range, of, range should be within that. Cost of fund plus 10 to 15%, then you are in the yellow zone of microcredit. Meaning you are on the high side, but try to bring it down to the green zone. Cost of fund plus 15% and above, then you are in the red zone, meaning that you are violating the whole mission of microcredit. So that's a limitation. And all we wanted to do is not to bring, bring back the loan sharking idea of using the poor people as a kind of tool to make money for ourselves. That's the only protection I wanted to make. Elisi. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Yunus. Uh, my name is Tracia. I am a student at Sciences Po X. Um, there have been many criticism that um, microfinance could uh, take money from the south uh, to the north. So what is your answer to, to that criticism? Yeah. Microcredit take from the south brings to the north, or the reverse. <laughs> I'm, I'm against both ways. I'm not even interested in taking money from the north going to the south. Yeah, we, like in Bangladesh, what we do for microcredit? Excuse, yeah. excuse me, it was not money, but resources. Sources? Resources. 
resources. resources. Uh, for microcredit resource, only resource I see is money. Uh, I don't know what other so resource you have in mind. Uh, but in terms of Bangladesh, uh, Grameen Bank, uh, Bra Grameen Bank is uh, self-reliant. It doesn't take money from outside. It doesn't take money from the government of Bangladesh. It doesn't take money from the, any bank or anybody. It doesn't take money from international sources. The money comes from the uh, depositors. We take the deposit as a bank, just like any other bank would do, and take this money and lend money to the borrowers. And we have uh, enough money to do that. Today, after 37 years, we lend out um, one and a half billion dollars each year. And that money keeps growing each year. And all this money comes from the deposits of the borrowers, uh, not only borrowers, also non-borrowers. The interesting thing is, Nearly half a billion dollars of this deposit is the deposit of the borrower themselves because they save in, in their own savings account tiny little money. And that tiny little money becomes big money over years. If you continue to save every week, year after year, it becomes bigger and bigger. So practically two-thirds of the money that they borrow is from their own money. So it's a kind of thing that uh, self makes it very independent, uh, never short of money anytime. And that's the point I make. Whenever we, we talk about microcredit, I would encourage microcredit to become self-reliant, but the legal framework stops that. Because microcredit organization being NGOs, they cannot take deposits. I said, why can't we make a law to convert those microfinance organization into microfinance banks? They do exactly what they do. In addition, they can take deposits. That solves all the problem. And I'm, I'm saying that I'm not, uh, I don't encourage people to take money from the North, rich country, to poor country to support microfinance. Because if it goes as a deposit, if it goes as a loan, this has to be paid back. And this exposes itself on the, uh, the uh, uh, flexibility of the uh, unpredictability of the uh, currency risk. You take enormous currency risk, then those currency risks will be passed on to those poor women to pay back this money. Suddenly your currency fell, and they have to pay a lot of money to pay back. I said, why do you do that? Because they didn't borrow euro, they didn't borrow dollar, but you brought all those uh, risks of that. So why, do, why don't you shield it off by not taking? Locally, you can organize a lot of uh, way to, uh, to generate that uh, deposits, generate this fund internally. So I encourage to do it in the local currency rather than exposed to the international currency. Une autre question. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Vincent, uh, Vice President of Student and Development, which is a French network of student NGOs. Um, Social developments have preceded uh, the dem democratization of banking in developed countries, uh, whereas in developing countries, the democratization of banking through microcredit is seen uh, as a precondition for development. How can you explain this reversal of logic? Well, I guess uh, in the developing countries, uh, the need was so enormous. The population who were left out from the banking system are so numerous that we had to come forward to do that. Uh, many of the Western institutions in the past address the same issue. Uh, savings Bank, Bank Populaire, uh, Raiffeisen Bank, many of those things. Uh, the banking system was not reaching out to the people, so they had to design a banking system to do that. While historically they have done that, but over years they again joined the mainstream banking forgetting the original uh, purpose of those banks. So we, what we have done unknowingly, we didn't know the history or uh, the background of those, uh, we created our own system, and it worked. And now today, uh, the people see that, it, it, that the same system has applicability everywhere, uh, because it's not related to a country-specific need. It is related to a global need. A vacuum. When we work in New York City, right next to us is the big payday lending operation going on. Payday lenders is a thriving business in America. Uh, interest rate of payday lenders, 
2,000%. Nobody pays any attention to it. It goes on, they publicize in the newspaper, in televisions, everywhere. But banking system never stepped out of the way and say, okay, we can solve this problem by extending our services to those people. They have not done that. So this is the crisis still continues. That takes away the um, productive capacity of human beings in, in transforming it into uh, services for human themselves to create their own income and also contribute to the economy of the country. They have been deprived of this opportunity. So I'm saying this is what we need to be fulfilled uh, across the board. We should sit together how to make the whole banking system as an inclusive system. If we had made this banking system inclusive system, the risk of all those sharp changes in the life would be much less when everybody has a way to take care of his own uh, life, and that will transform the whole economic system. Une question encore? Hey, good morning, my name is Tiffany, and I'm currently studying in Dauphin University. And I was wondering if companies should adapt their product and prices to the poorest customers, or thanks to an inclusive business, or if it would be better to, uh, sorry, to increase their income thanks to economic tools. I missed the point. The last point? Yeah, last point. Uh, well, if it was better to increase their income thanks to economic tools like microcredit or... Yeah. Well, many different ways. I mean, microcredit is one, then we are talking about introducing the idea of social businesses because most, most of the companies are used to uh, giving, uh, creating foundations, for example. Many companies have their own foundations. Many companies, most of the companies have CSR activity. These are all charity-based activities. Uh, so charity-based activities has limitation. I mentioned earlier that charity money can do the work only once. It cannot repeat. There, we have to go back and find new money to do the same thing over again. So I said, when you have these donation wings, like foundations, CSR, and other activities, we can easily convert them into business activities, social business activities. It could be microcredit, easily. So microcredit funds can be created where you can put the money so that money can be recycled. People borrow money, pay you back, and you send it back again. It becomes a very powerful tool to empower people. Or it can be a social business, uh, addressing the problem of unemployment, problem of health care, problem of single mother, problem of old age, whatever problem we see around us. It's all our creative mind how we do that. So the companies and businesses uh, can transform part of their activities, at least basically uh, charity activities, into social business. When you do that, you are, you are not only giving the money uh, for social business, to distinguish the charity. In charity, what we do, we write a check and give it to somebody. Mostly we do give it to NGO so that they can carry on their work. But if you do a social business, the company has to create a new company. So you have to get involved. The moment you get involved, your creative power gets involved. You cannot simply say, okay, we will put the money and forget about it. No, this is a company you created. It has its own life now. And it's your, uh, it's your daughter company. So you cannot walk away from that. So immediately you get into the problem. You bring your creative power into it. And one issue I, uh, tried, I would like to bring out to your attention, then when we have all your employees in your company, they use their talent, their creative power to make sure the company is successful, the shareholders have a better return on their investment, and that is the mission of the company. So they use their creative power to make that happen. But in making that happen, they are bringing their creative power only one part of themselves, because it needs one particular skill in your life. But you have many other things in, inside of you which were never used. The moment you create a social business, employees find it very attractive to use other parts of them which were re remain unutilized by the company and un unutilized by the society to bring that creative power to solve the problem. So it does two things. One, create a business which is sustainable and then draw the creative power 
in the technology in your command in solving problems. It becomes much more attractive for all of, us, all of the people involved in the company. But the question also touched upon the, the quality of the product. Should it be adjusted to the level of income of the, the poor consumer? Mm, that, Am I right? Is yes. That, yeah. yeah. It's, it's called, I was trying to put it in a problem solving. If you're not making a product which is available to them, you make a grand, grand product, but nobody can touch it, you're not solving the problem. So the, by, by definition, you have to be a problem solving company. In order to problem solving, you have to be reaching them. So made it very cheap, for example. The product is extremely cheap. But you, you sell it in your uh, Paris store. Who gets it? Nobody comes to Paris to buy it. You have to bring it to the people where they are so that they can access it. So making it cheap is not enough. You have to make it available so that she, she can just go it. Because you put it in some place, she will never go there. So even if it is cheap, it is unattractive. So cheapness is important, but it's not sufficient. Sufficient thing, is it available to her in a way she can handle this? Uh, she will never come to the city, she will never come to the town. Her daughter, her children, uh, is not coming to buy yogurt from a store uh, which is far away, she will never go there. She doesn't shop there. So it has to be at her distance and so on. So that's an important element. Price is important, attractiveness, that she understands this, and the fact that it's available to her. All this, like when we did microcredit, for example, uh, we made the rule right from the beginning. The simple rule that we made, people should not come to the bank. Bank should go to the people. Today, Grameen Bank has eight and a half million borrowers. It spread into 80,000 villages of Bangladesh, Bangla meaning every single village in Bangladesh. Do they have to come to our office? No, because the principle is people should not come to the bank. Bank should go to people. So what we do, it's a responsibility of Grameen Bank to go to all these eight and a half million borrowers in 80,000 villages at their doorstep every week to do the business at their doorstep. So that has happened. If we made it microcredit and set in our office, it will not reach women. Very simple. Keeping everything else same, except not making it available to the doorstep. It doesn't function. So everywhere you hear about microcredit is the same thing. It's not office-based functioning of the system. So that's a very important aspect. On atteint malheureusement la, la limite de l'horaire qui nous a été accordé parce que c'est une très longue journée avec de brillants intervenants qui bou, bouillent d'impatience. Uh, Professor Yunus, if I may ask as a conclusion, uh, the theme of uh, today's conference is the best is yet to come. Uh, we have seen figures just published by the World Bank Uh, which are encouraging in the sense that uh, the level of poverty is decreasing in the world in spite of uh, the demography. What, in your view, would be the best to come in the fight against poverty? Uh, I don't know why World Bank says that. <laughs> I'll show you. I have the Now, article with me. Yeah, because... Uh, We are also coming to the completion of the Millennium Development Goal, which is achieving it by 2015. And number one goal is to reduce poverty by half by 2015. In that case, World Bank is saying that goal not only is not accomplished, it is the reverse. It increased poverty. Uh, but that's not my feeling. It's a poverty is declining, very visibly declining. Uh, China alone, has uh, taken out more than 500 million people out of poverty. Just to look at the numbers uh, alone, it's a, never in history was happen such a big number in one country is transformed into poor poverty situation to non-poverty. And Bangladesh, again, another case where is a huge poverty, but we are right on the track to go there in, by 2015, reducing poverty by 
that year, by 2015. So many countries in Asia will be achieving that goal. The problem will be in Africa. Many countries probably will not. Some countries may come near what it. So it's not across the globe that it's not happening. The trend is positive. But the question is, we are only looking at the uh, income kind of indicators for poverty reduction. There are many other issues of poverty, uh, education, health, and so on and so forth. So we have to see it in a, a, a complete way. Uh, so that way, uh, poverty on the, on the definition of Millennium Development Goals is declining. So that uh, our next target would be in the next 15 years when we have the second Millennium Development Goal uh, set uh, to reduce poverty to zero. That's a logical conclusion. But that's not my answer. My answer is what is the best coming. Best coming, I see it not in a statistical way that how best is coming. And I give the, uh, I would like to go back to the uh, fact that people went to the moon. And now people want to go beyond moon and Mars and Jupiter's, God knows where else. And we always think like that. That's what the human aspirations are. We want to go beyond what we already have. And that mind never stopped. So we, since we cannot go there, we write science fictions. And we have science fiction movies, Star Wars. We have science fiction uh, TV series, Star Trek, go into other galaxy and all kinds of things. The interesting thing is, it's not the science fiction what we see. The interesting thing is, science is always, real science is always following science fiction and make it happen. And that's how we went to the moon. That's how we are putting our space stations, we, all kinds of things. But unfortunate thing is, we do not write social fictions. If we had write, written social fictions, we would have done that. Because imagination is very important. So best thing for us is to imagine, write science, uh, social fictions. What should our society be? and create those fictions, characters, and make into movie series, uh, social fiction movie series. Then we'll say, why not? We can do that. And that's the inspiration, not just projecting. Projection doesn't take us anywhere. Projections are always wrong. Nobody said Berlin Wall will fall by projection, but it fell. Nobody said Soviet Union will disintegrate and disappear by projection. Nobody said that, but it happened. All the impossible things happen because we want it in intensively, we desire it, we imagine it. Then it happens. I think that's the best thing to do. This young generation ready for those imaginations, wild, wild imaginations, and we'll make it happen. Merci beaucoup.